Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so today the webinar is about refactoring various applications with RubyMine. My name is Andrzej Krzywda. Thank you, Tatiana, for introducing me. I work at RKNC, a, a company I founded, uh, which is a Rails company. I do Rails since 2004, so w since it started. And since that time, I was responsible for working on, developing on, reviewing, and mm, improving hundreds of Rails projects so far. So I've seen many different patterns, what happens with Rails projects, and hopefully I learned some lessons. So I want to share some of the lessons with, with you today. So the agenda of this webinar is that I will talk about uh, typical Rails problems, things that I see happening over and over again in Rails projects. And I will try to be constructive and suggest some, some alternatives and some uh, some new ways, new patterns we can use to develop race applications after some time. And I will show you one refactoring example uh, with RubyMine. And this will be a small refactoring session with several steps. And yeah, and that will be, that will be with uh, some coding live session. So hopefully everything goes well, goes well here. Okay, so let me start with saying that race is great. Uh, so this is not uh, some kind of uh, a skeptical session here about Rails. Rails is great, great at the beginning. And when I say Rails, I also mean the Rails way of doing uh, web applications. So in the first month of development, everything is great. You, have, you see quick results with almost no code. Uh, it feels very fast and it feels very light. And you have very quick feedback loop and you deliver features at a predictable speed. So uh, thanks to all of that, your customer or your users, they love you, your customer loves you, and you love Rails, so it's all great. And then, two months later, you see some typical, what I call typical Rails problems. It's, uh, those are situations where you see that uh, MVC is not enough sometimes, so you see some code that doesn't really fit very well into the controller, doesn't fit very well into the models. It also contains logic, so it doesn't fit very well in the views. But it needs to be somewhere. So this is the, the moment where, where the new if statements appear. You maybe have some conditional validations in your Rails models, uh, some more complex uh, before filters in your controllers. So this is what is happening. This is still not bad. You see, First regression bugs usually. So I'm talking about this hypothetical situation that you are in the second or third month of development. And you see first regression bugs. And obviously regression bugs, um, by definition, they are things that used to work and now they are now, they now stopped working for some reason. Which may mean that your customer, customer no longer loves you as much as they did in the first month. There might be some trust issues somewhere in this time, period of time. And from the development perspective, you also see some consequences. The tests are slower. This is the moment where you, when you Google how to speed up the Rails test suite, for example, and depending on, the, on your testing strategy, you may have the, the test may be uh, taking now, I don't know, one minute or, 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 or five minutes, depending on whether you test via browser or not. And also when it comes to de delivering features, you see, a bit of a slower progress now. So it's not so great anymore. It's not so also bad. So then six months later, again, we are now somewhere in the ninth, tenth month of development. A bit more problems. And also this is the moment when usually the members of the team may change. So someone leaves, someone new, new comes in. So you see hidden dependencies. Uh, someone took some assumptions. Uh, or followed very mm, re religiously the Rails way, and there are some dependencies between one part of the code and, and another via some global setting or a class name. People are a bit uh, scared to change class names because they, they, they create a dependency and something may break suddenly. And also, mm, you see security bugs, mm, not the kind of security bugs that Rails itself is responsible for. It's the security bugs from your application. So maybe your, some of your users are allowed to see things that they shouldn't see. So there is some, there are some leaks on, of information. So again, the trust issues with the customer. 
hopefully it's you're still in a good relationship with your customer with your users and also what's what's happening somewhere after one year of development is that you see rails upgrades so the upgrade of the rails framework are now projects on their own and they take they can take huge budgets so i i'm i know of projects that are that the cost of the rails upgrades were was easily close to one hundred thousand of dollars for example we are talking about huge projects here so Rails upgrades are difficult because so much code relies on the, on the Rails. So every change is now uh, very scary. And after Rails upgrades, you need to test a lot and be aware of many different problems that may happen. And it's not so easy to understand if you're a non-technical person. So if you're the, the typical uh, mythical customer, it's not so easy to understand why it takes so long and why, why it's risky, why it's scary, why things are broken now. And two years later, if you are uh, lucky enough to work on such projects. The team members have been replaced for several times now. People don't remember that the, why some decisions were made at the beginning. And just yesterday I was reading this uh, Reddit story on the Reddit. Uh, someone says that they, they started, they joined a company and there are several models with 3,000 lines of code, controllers with 2,000 lines, filters, logic in the views, um, yeah, poor test coverage. And what's interesting, and I, I, I've noticed that when I started working on my Rails refactoring book, when I started working on that book, people contacted me to tell their own stories uh, from their Rails projects. And what's interesting is that many people think that it's only happening to their projects. So they're not aware that it's, a, it's kind of a bigger problem and it is a pattern. And I'm not saying that every Rails project ends in with this, but it's, it's, it's a pattern that I've seen enough to, to say this is happening very often. Uh, so this is like two years of the de development, and you see the, 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 this story is about a Rails free code base, so they will have security issues soon, and probably they, stuck, they are stuck with Rails free because it was too difficult or too costly to, to, to upgrade. So we may see many different reasons here. So are there any questions so far with, with this story? Okay, I'm assuming there are no questions. I'm not sure if I can see something easily here. So Tatiana, please interrupt me if there were any questions. Okay, so I'm gonna suggest you to follow some new guidelines after some time with a Rails project. It's probably good to follow, start following those guidelines, I don't know, after the second or third month of development. Um, so it's better to turn your code to be more explicit than implicit. So Rails being very implicit, being very hidden with, some, with certain things, uh, is very good for, for the beginning because it makes you, makes you very fast. But at some point you need to turn the code to be more explicit. I'm suggesting to reduce the meta programming, so relying on some certain method names and class names and making the connection between certain modules with that. And I will try to introduce, suggest you some new building blocks. But where, where is this all coming from? I'm, I'm, I, was, I spent some time uh, on researching those architectures here, and it was, it was, uh, some time spent on reading about it, but also practicing those architectures within the Rails context. So I learned some lessons and I was uh, experimenting with different approaches here. So what I took is I collected the techniques that work best within the Rails context, in my opinion. So it's one set, one collection of techniques that might be good for you. It's not the only one, it's not a silver, silver bullet. It, will, it won't solve all of your problems, but hopefully it will at least slightly improve your situation in a, in a Rails project. So I was inspired by domain-driven design, hexagonal architecture, DCI, CQRS, and event sourcing. And the, the techniques I'm going to show you today are mostly taken from domain-driven design. So this is the part where we will be focusing on. So this is also the place to go if you want to study those topics a bit more in depth. This webinar will just touch some of the topics but there are very good books about domain driven design, very good blog posts we can, we can go to. Uh, so the building blocks that come mostly from the DD world are service objects, repositories, adapters, form objects, and domain objects. 
and another building block is Ruby mine here because it supports working with big uh, Rails applications very well. So those are the things. And now when you look at them, they seem a bit abstract and you may not know how to connect them to, to each other. So I'm showing you now a, a web sequ a sequence diagram, how, uh, how the um, life cycle of a Rails request can look like once you have this kind of uh, Mm, this kind of patterns. So it's not all of them here in this diagram, and uh, it's not that this is the best the best variation. It's just one possible variation how we can use them. And there are many different flavors of form objects, service objects. So it's best to experiment and to find your own. I will show you one example today. So if we go from the left, we start with controller receiving some action with some params, and then we have the form object which takes the params and it can do the, the most basic validations. So you can introduce the form object so that your Rails models, models don't need to do so much validations anymore. They can focus on just the most important one that to, to take care of database constraints or data consistency. In the form object you can use the ones that are about uh, whether uh, a param is actually non empty or of a good length and so on. Uh, so once those params are validated via the form object, you can go to the service object and pass the data structure from the form and pass it to service object. So we see the call here. And right now, just, just to make, make you aware, I will show this sequence diagram uh, at the end of the webinar as well. So after we'll see some code, it may feel a bit more familiar. Now let me just tell you that we will, in, in this diagram, we are using the repository, so the repo object which is re responsible for taking the active record objects and repacking them into domain objects. I call them domain objects, but also another good name is uh, data transfer objects. So we are, so the repository is kind of a boundary between us and the active record. And if you look at the left side and the right side, we live here in some kind of a, um, I call it a Rails sandwich. So on the left side, we have the HTTP Rails things. On the right side, you have the uh, database active record parts. And we live in the middle, and hopefully, after applying some of the techniques here, we are totally isolated from Rails in the middle. And then runtime, we are connected to the Rails uh, Rails framework. So this the, the sandwich will now work. Okay. So I, I hope that it, it gives you at least a bit of the vision where we are going to, so that I can show you some refactoring steps how to make uh, how to make it. Um, in small steps, so obviously I, I will not show you the whole scenario in the code, but just one part of extracting the service object. So why am I focusing on service object first? Is it the most beneficial pattern? Not really. However, what I learned, what I noticed is that once the teams follow extracting the service object uh, refactoring recipes, they, they, be, they become trained in refactoring. Uh, in many Rails teams, Refactoring is not so popular, so people are not really well trained in that. Uh, so extracting a service object is quite a safe technique and something that can make you more confident in your skills in reshaping the design of your Rails application, which is, I think, very important. And I call it that a service object is a, it's like a gateway drug. So once you start with the service object, you can go deeper at some point. So you will. Uh, you will try to use your, the repository pattern maybe or the adapter object or the form object. So this is like an introduction to this domain-driven design world. And also it's worth noting that if, if you are already familiar with DDD, that uh, there are three different kinds of service objects in DDD, but in Rails we focus, we usually use just one type for, for simplicity and it's usually enough. And those are the application service objects, so application services. So what we usually do with service objects is actually the DDD application services. And in its essence, extracting a service object in the Rails context means take the controller action and turn it into a method object. And a method object is an object with one public method, usually it's called call or execute. So that's, that's, what, we, uh, that's what we will do. Okay, are there any questions? Maybe I will. Any questions? Actually, there was an interesting question about uh, when is the best time to start refactoring? And 
I think this question is a good question for you. <laughs> okay, so that's that's a tricky question. Uh, it's good to start refactoring when you are mm, trained in refactoring a little bit, so you feel confident. Refactoring in all in all the good things and with all the benefits, it's also a risky operation. So if you are working on some money heavy application and you just start randomly refactor something because you think that would be a good idea it's it's, it's worth being aware that it's a, that's a, it's a risky thing so but once you know what you're doing and what's your goal and also once your team is aware what you want to do it's good to do refactoring at any point the sooner the better so also this talk here this webinar is not about telling you about those big refactorings that, that are happening within I don't know two weeks sessions or two months sessions I'm talking about small very small very limited refactorings that can, that can happen with every ticket you are working on in our team we have this guideline that you can spend some time um, on every ticket you you're actually expected to spend some time on refactoring so try to clean the code a little bit and you can do it at any point but again, it's important that your team is aware of the vision you're going to, and the team agrees. Otherwise, you will have uh, people where problems and the human factor will become even more important than, than the technical issues. So make sure, make sure your team is ready. Make sure you discuss everything with the team. And maybe one interesting point from my side, because I think that, if, for example, if you are working in iterations and you are working with some user stories, use cases or something with some features, I think it's always good to um, start every new feature with thinking about what refactoring we can do to make this feature the best way. I think that sometimes it works as well. So, mm -hmm. yes, just a small comment. So also, it depends which parts you want to refactor. So today we will focus on controllers and it's, it's good to understand how con controllers are created, how they work under the hood. Uh, what are their smaller building blocks and you, you, you need to really understand it before you go there So or if you refactor race models you need to really well understand what's going on and also it's not the topic of this webinar But uh, you need to have at least some test coverage be before you start So you need to have some automated tests being run During the refactoring sessions so that you feel safe that you run on the green all, all the time. So Basically, you want to be green after every small step, and the small step shouldn't take more than a few minutes, for example, which is a difficult thing to, to do. Uh, so you need to train to, to make it well. And so that, that, that's the topic of my next part here. So I, I assume there is no more questions so far. Uh, I'll answer them later. So it's good to understand what are the dependencies in a typical controller. So if you take the uh, controller which looks like the scaffolded one, and I'm sure many of your controllers look like that. You see uh, some dependencies, like the new action uses the new view, so that's a dependency. New action depends on the new view. Create action also depends on the new view, because when there is an unsuccessful create action, it renders the new view with errors this time. And also edit action uses the new view, and new view uses uh, the form partial, and uh, sorry, the edit action also uses the form partial, Edit action, this is edit view. So there's quite a few dependencies, which means at the end that the, for example, the form partial is used from uh, indirectly from four different actions. It's worth knowing because uh, if you change anything in the form partial uh, or whatever partial you reuse, it, it's, you can break things in other places. That's another way of looking at it. So you have new create, edit, update. They all use new or edit, and in the end, they all use the form partial. And also, if you have some kind of API builders, like Redmine has this uh, Rails builder pattern format here, you also have some API, mm, some API builders, and they depend on whatever you do in the controllers as well. So it's good to have this mental model to, to understand uh, how, how, what, what's the bigger picture here. Otherwise, you will break the controllers, and in the end, you will break some features. So just carrying on with the controller dependencies, I'm sure you are familiar with filters. I called it the filters algebra because sometimes people are so creative with them that we have filters depending on each other. So it's important that one filter is run before the, the next one. So you need to understand in what order they are run actually. 
and it's especially important if you want to inline filters. It's one of the refactoring recipes I am suggesting to do at some point that you are inlining the filters, but you need to do it in a special order so that you don't break things. And before filters are hard to decouple, so once they create a group of filters, they're like a block, a blob that it's hard to decouple. And what we see is very often we see communication via instance variables. And that's the biggest thing to understand and be aware of. At the controller's views, at the controllers in the views level, everything is communicating with each other via instance variables. So instance variables, everything is depending on instance variables. That's important. If you change anything with the instance variables, you need to be aware that some action may may not break, or some before filter, or some view, or some partial. So controller instance variables are the global mutable state of the controller so and it, it also make it makes it difficult because when you want to test your control in isolation let's say you want to do it you need to prepare the global state because it can be in many different situations so you have many different contexts and that makes the whole situation a bit more complex so it's not a problem when you, when you're starting and you are just having this the the easy situation with not so many instance variables. Usually you have one instance variable per per controller, uh, or I don't know, two or three max. But after sometimes you will see more and more of them. So and I will show one example today. Uh, so I'm gonna show you the Redmine project. I hope that some some of you are already familiar with it. Uh, so overall, it's a project management tool written in Rails, obviously. It contains a time tracking module. There's a link here, so later on you can you can look at the time tracking more closely. What's interesting is that the Redvine project is very successful, uh, very successfully used by many people, including our company, uh, since 2007. So that's a that's a one good example of a old big Rails application. It's very good for practicing different kinds of refactorings. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm encouraging people to to use it as the as the sandbox. It's a good place. They have quite good test coverage. Not perfect, but it should be good enough for many cases. So you can go there, uh, set up it set it up locally uh, and play with it. And I'm going to focus on the time tracking feature. We will focus on one specific action, how to create a time entry in this application. So obviously, when you have a project management, management tool, you have some kind of tickets. Here, they are called issues. And you, the time tracking module, when it's activated in Redmine, it's interesting. Redmine has this concept of modules you can mm, uh, plug in and plug, plug off. And this is the form, this is the main form of adding the time entry. So you are saying to which issue you are adding a time entry, what's the date of it, how many hours you spent on that, and then you can add comment, and also you can select what was the activity. And that's another place where you can also log time. So that's a place where you're already in the issue view, so you know what's the issue. And also you can log time on a project and not on an issue. We'll see this, we'll see it in the code. And then once you log the time, you have uh, uh, several different reports that are using in time entries. So the data is presented in some other way to people. Uh, as I said, we use it with our customers sometime, uh, sometimes, and it's very useful. You can, you can see how much time was spent. So now I will switch to RubyMine, and I will show you some code uh, finally. And we'll start by um, looking at the existing concerns in the, in the, in the action that we are, we are going to work on. Then I will run this, some subset of tests. We don't need to run all of the tests, all of the controller tests all the time. And definitely we don't need to run all the Redmine tests all the time. So it's one good um, thing to do that when you are refactoring and you know that you are not going outside of some scope, just find the tests that are relevant to your situation right now. Run those tests, make sure they're at least uh, that they're fast enough. We'll see this here, hopefully. And then I will keep refactoring for as long as this live coding session doesn't break. And at the end, I hopefully will finish with some shape of the service object. And I can then go back to the sequence diagram and show you what might be the next steps. So now I'm switching to, uh, to RubyMine, I think. Yes, this, this may also be a good time to, to answer some question now. So if there is any, 
I can answer now, Tatiana. Yes, so there are some questions. So, for example, uh, mm -hmm. let me go to the, to the beginning. So, for example, the question about how to build a refactor strategy when your test coverage is not good enough. Mm -hmm. that's, oh, that's, a, that's a difficult situation, but all of us are in this situation. So, so if that's something, um, yeah, you need to build the test coverage. That's a short answer. So don't refactor to complicated things when you don't have test coverage. It's just too risky. It's, uh, it's not responsible. It's not professional to do it. But I know how it is. So uh, if you are super certain that you can do certain refactorings and you can manually test it uh, after, some, after some changes, uh, then you can do it. So you need to just be super safe. And I think uh, RubyMine is, is quite good here as a tool to support you because it, at least it highlights the things that uh, may look like problems or like errors. So use a real ID uh, in this process of, of refactoring. But overall, build a test coverage because it, it's really not so difficult once you're familiar with, with how to build tests. Uh, you can spend some time and have at least some of them uh, before you start. So in this example that I'm going to show you, uh, we, are, we are also not fully covered, even though the, the coverage tools will cheat us and say that we are fully covered. So we, you are never fully covered. So that's the problem. So after every such refactoring session, you need to go through the, so you don't need to manually test after every change, but you can uh, change before you push to, to master or before you push to the branch you're using. So be aware, prepare the, uh, be prepared for the situation that you need to put the tester hat and just see if you broke anything. Uh, overall, there is no escape for, from writing tests, I'm, I'm afraid. So you, you just become fluent in it and, and write some tests. So I hope it answered the questions. Is there anyone, anything else to answer? Okay. If so we let have me... some more time, but uh, a lot of people ask for showing RubyMine, so maybe we can switch to RubyMine and answer okay. some questions. And sure. So now we are in RubyMine. I hope you see my editor now. And uh, so here I am having the um, the structure view. I see all the actions that you're familiar. We are focusing on create. And I, I have used the Scratch Files features to list the concerns that we see in this action. Uh, so this may also answer the question about the, 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 the refactoring strategy and testing strategy. So I'm listing all the things that I'm noticing about the, the action, about the piece of code that I'm changing. So if we go to this control, this create action, it's not the worst action. I'm pretty sure you've seen worse, worse than that, but it's also not very trivial. So there is some logic about rend rendering, redirecting depends on some params or some data, lots of um, instance variables. I think that maybe not lots, but at least three in this one action. And so many different concerns here. Obviously, we also have uh, the filters algebra here. So not so many, but they depend on each other. And when I listed the concerns, uh, oh, sorry, this is, this is a test actually. So there's quite a lot of tests, but they don't cover everything. Uh, luckily, the developers use the, the prefix test create, which will be helpful soon. So uh, so before, so here, here is the, the list of concerns. I will go through it soon. Let's show me that, you, I will show you that we can uh, uh, create a subset of tests. So here is the test unit is used. And I use the filter to select the ones that are interesting to me right now because that's part of my coding session. Uh, so I use the regex and, and I can run the test. And by the way, uh, when I'm now using a shortcut, Control R, you can see this green bar here, and uh, it will show you what are the things that I used. And right now, um, here is the panel with all the tests. So it didn't took much, a lot of time, just two seconds uh, in, with the race runtime. So it's not so bad. I can run it after every change. And that's, that was just the subset. So that, that's, that's, that's the part. OK. And now uh, the list of concerns. So we have some caching of time entry. We will go back to it. So the caching, I mean, this memoization. Uh, we have the concept of current user. That's always we have the concept of time, probably related to time zones. Uh, 
like yeah, it's hard for me to, to see what's on the right side here. But anyway, that there is the concept of time zones. We have some authorization rules. Uh, we have some HTTP ways and several different things. And once you list all of the concerns, you may feel overwhelmed by the, the, the things. So it's good to group them some way. So with those techniques that I'm, that I'm suggesting to you, uh, the important grouping is that I want to leave everything HTTP related in the controller while moving everything else to the service object. So that will be the, the, the thing that will guide me. When in doubt, leave the HTTP in the controller, move everything else out step by step. And by HTTP, it's, uh, again, it's a bit of over generalization. I mean HTML, JSON, Flash, so the mm, mm, messages to the user, uh, rendering plus all the UI logic. And everything else is service object. If we had more time, we would also go to implementing repository, but, but that's not enough. There's not enough time right now. We can also go to domain objects and form objects if there is uh, more time available. That's an example of the test. So we are preparing some data in the request, and then we are expecting that things are changed in the database. So those kind of tests are also not bad. By the way, that's, that's may, may answer some questions about how to test. Uh, tests at the request level, at the controller level, and what, as long as you have this kind of code, so the controller manipulates the active records directly, it's good to test the output as well this way, for example, because you have, this is like an integration test, so you, you test through all the layers. And that's good because now you can change the code inside and this doesn't break the test. If we relied very heavily on, on mocks here, it will be more difficult to test. So mocking's, mocking is not always so cool. All right, so we have some uh, concerns listed. So now we are, I think, aware of the problems and we can start. And now it's important to think that when you are doing refactoring, you're doing only refactoring. So don't add a feature right now, don't uh, change too much things that we are not sure. So try to limit your, your scope of work to, to the refactoring and hopefully everything will be fine. Excuse me. And so I, I want to start with just one place where I will change the behavior. So basically refactoring should re preserve the behavior. But I'm pretty certain that this memoization is not needed here. So I, run, I can run the test and I'm doing it now. Obviously we can't fully trust the test here. Not everything is covered here. By the way, I can run the test with coverage. So that's a nice Ruby mine feature here that it takes a little bit longer. I don't need to do it after every step, but when it happens, it's, it's showing me this, this pane here on the right, which is uh, at the moment not, not, not so interesting because we have, this, uh, uh, we have this green bar here. So we can see which parts of the code are covered with test. And basically all, all lines of code are covered. And test coverage is another huge topic to talk about, but we will uh, just say that even though we are almost fully covered here, it means that the, code, the tests are running through the lines, but they are not, for example, they are not testing whether we call the call hook with the right arguments. So if we mess up and we, uh, and we pass some wrong arguments, we are not covered with tests. That's an important thing to know. And so, so we need to be super careful, even though we have some tests here. So, uh, now I will show you one technique, uh, how I'm using uh, RubyMine live templates to create a service object because I'm doing it quite often. So you see it actually showing me this, and this is my shortcut, you can call it whatever you want, and this lives in the preferences live templates. So uh, if we go here, I can type live templates, and I'm not going to show you all the details, but here I can uh, show you that there are some existing ones, and there are some, some of the ones that I added. So that's a good way to tweak. And when I'm uh, clicking tap, it expands, so that's a live template. It's a very simple one, so you can obviously type it, type it on your own. But when you do several things, like if in, in testing, for example, you can repeat the assertions and so on, it's good to have the live templates ready. And I will create time and create time entry service object and it's always an, an issue how to call it. So start with the most basic name and at some point you will find a better name. So it's good to start with something and be confident that you can refactor it at any point. So and when I did it, uh, obviously it doesn't change any tests. I can run the test in the background because it doesn't cost really, it doesn't cost me anything. So everything is still working fine. I can 
to uh, I can initialize this code and I can call execute. Often people ask what's the good name for this method. So we either use call or we either use execute. In the end, it doesn't really matter so much. So a call might be better because in tests you can replace the service object with a proc, for example, or for lambda. So that's, that's good. When I run the test, this code doesn't do anything. It's still running. But I wanted to show you the habit of running the test continuously all the time. You can even turn the auto, auto testing features somewhere here. I'm just you know, pressing control R and that it, this works for me. So now I want to slowly move some code to, to here, to the, to the service object. And basically what I did is I want to return Okay, and when I run the test, they will break now, they will fail. That's because I moved some code with, with dependencies to, to, to this. So luckily, at least one test failed. By the way, RubyMine has this nice feature of clicking on in this stack trace, I can see what exactly failed, and very often it's, it's useful. Uh, but I know, I know what I did. I'm expecting the evars to exist here, but they are set in the before filters in the controller. And by the way, I create the service object in the controller so that I'm close to the place that I'm changing. I will be slowly moving some more code to this. It doesn't mean that I will end with this uh, kind of code. I will move it to a separate file at some point. But for now, it's just more convenient to, to keep it here. So I want the, I want the execute method to expect a project and issue. And I can now change that this is what I expect. So luckily, that quotes luckily, we have a global usage of user current. We don't need to pass it just yet. I'm doing step by step. I will not save the word at once. That's, that's, that's something to worth remembering. So don't try to fix everything at once. Um, okay, and now I need to pass uh, project and issue, and I, I can run the test, and I think they will pass. I can be more explicit here because that will be useful very soon and extract a variable here and just be very explicit and say return time entry. Oops. This didn't change and the tests are still passing. So now I can move another line. So that's a technique that I'm showing you. Uh, just go and grab the first line of code that is possible, move it to the service object and see. It doesn't seem to be related to HTTP almost apart from params. We, by the way, we need params, so add it to, to the expected methods. Now you see uh, RubyMine is showing that it, this on red because now it's missing one argument. So another small thing that is worth, uh, why it's worth using this kind of environment. So that was, that was an HTTP. I don't have a problem with this happening in the, in the service object. Uh, so this is this is where we are uh, right now. Now is a more interesting part, and uh, we'll move another piece of code to the service object. But before we do that, this is the if statement. So this logic here is about authorization, whether the current user is allowed to do something. I'm I'm super okay with this being in the service object. What I'm not okay is that I don't really want to render 403 from the service object, and that's a very often situation that you will you will. Need to make the you need to make decisions whether it's a it's something that you want to do at controller level or at service object level. So this is something that clearly belongs to the controller, in my opinion. It's also worth noting that we have this return statement here, and it's very important to keep it here because it breaks the flow and that all the other code is not executed. So that's uh, that's something we have here, and now how can we make this communication between the controller, between the action and the service object in cases like this, when we actually want to leave the if statement block uh, inside the controller and everything else in the service object. So there are several different approaches. You can use the return codes from the service object, but also you can use exceptions. Uh, I will show you today a more functional approach. I will pass a proc to the, mm, to the service object. So please note that if we do this, So if we do this here, uh, this is still the same. So we can wrap anything with proc and run call of that, and that's the same. So 
so things are still working. Okay, so what happens if we pass this proc? I'm copying now. So this, this is often a very often technique. I'm, I'm copying an, uh, something to duplicate for a moment temporarily, and then I will remove it. So I will pass it here to the service object as, a, as the constructor argument. And so that's what it looks like. So now I need to do um, initialize and I want to have I want I need to na name it somehow naming is very difficult as we all know and so here it's actually rendered for all free but from the service object it's it's not allowed so we don't want to use the diction the vocabulary from the controller in the service object so from the from the controller objects from the service object perspective it's something that we call when we when the user is not allowed so let's call it not allowed I could call it not allowed callback I will Keep it a bit shorter for now. And just passing it and never using it obviously doesn't break the test, but it's good to run the test and make sure that I didn't do any typo or anything stupid. All is good so far, I'm happy. And I can now do this, I can copy, again, I'm not cutting, I'm just copying. So time entry, we already know that it's not an EVAR here, it's, it's this, user current, this is all available. And again, time entry is available. And now we are calling uh, the not allowed. So now we can remove this part. And this should preserve the behavior. We are still in the same situation. Yep, that's good. One thing to note, and we'll see it very soon, is that if the block that was passed would use uh, the instance variables, we would need to make a parameter to the proc. We need to pass the instance variables because it's not yet available. Time entry is set one step before. So with callbacks, we use a different control flow. And it's a bit more like functional programming. Obviously, it's not a functional programming, full functional programming, but it is a bit more FP than we, we used to have. And now, now we can pass this. And by the way, why it's a proc and not a lambda? Uh, this is a, an exercise for you, maybe. Uh, with, if we pass a lambda, return would, would run in the scope of the lambda, so it wouldn't really return. While proc is a closure, uh, and it will return ha is happening in the, in the right level, so that, that, that's good. Uh, so now I can now I, I can actually use lambda. That's more typical. Procs are very rarely used. Oh, I have this panel here, so I need to. Oops. I think I, I wrote something. Uh, so I I was wrapping this lambda, and we need to do it here. Okay, and now we can uh, add that we expect this to be passed, and the call hook. This is something from from Redmine that is about the, their pop up mechanism. So they have this internal system of notifying things. It's not really very controller HTTP related, but because they use this controller in the name, uh, I, I decided to, to, to pass it to inside. Uh, so I want to run it in the context of, of the controller. And from the perspective of the, uh, of the service object, this is just something like uh, uh, before save hook. Okay, and now bef just before I return, I want to run the before uh, save hook dot call. And by the way, now is the moment where I need to be a bit more careful. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a very limited view here, so I need to do a bit some splitting. And this line is obviously too long to keep it like that, but I don't want to refactor it right now. And the problem is that now we need this time entry. So I will make it an argument here, and I will say time entry here. And what I can do is do uh, time entry is time entry now. And this, I hope this, this is going to work. Uh, Okay, so I can now see where I'm not passing something. 
And the problem is that now I am uh, expecting a create time entry to take uh, before safe hook, and that's correct. So what's wrong in here? Okay, maybe I'll simplify it a bit uh, just to make it more clear. So we are having a constructor, a create time entry. We are passing a proc, we are passing a lambda. Uh, we will soon not need that anymore. And we call this before safe hook dot call when it's passed. So why am I seeing the problem? Okay, I think that's the uh, undefined local variable time entry now. Okay, so now it's back to this. Okay, so the tests are now passing, and I no longer need to do this. And we have, we are just not one, two small steps before finishing this session. And before we do any refactoring here, we have this big if statement. And by the way, RubyMine is showing very nicely when you have a big if statement that if you are going to put your cursor in the end statement, you see at the top, I see the response to. So I can see where it begins from. And especially in the big Rails, ugly applications, you have those big if statements, so it's much easier to, to, to know where you are. And I'm going to use uh, alt command M, extract method, and that's the respond create success. That's the name I'm choosing here. And I will do the same here. Respond create failure. So what we do is a very simple uh, extract method refactoring, and this code is now slightly better, I think. So I could carry on with this refactoring, but I will stop now because I think I I, I showed you enough of the rules. So it's not uh, it's more about showing you some rules, some guidelines, what you can use. So respond create success, we could do, we could pass them as the callbacks, we could call them success and failure, and this will be expected in here. And we can then use this if time entry dot save in the service object. So uh, what we leave here is a refactoring that is, did this, I believe it did some improvement, not full improvement. We could do some more, we can, we can use the user current as a parameter, so you can always do more. But what's important and make probably many people want to know is when to stop refactoring. You don't want to keep doing like two weeks refactoring sessions. Uh, you, often you can't afford it. So you try to try to have a common agreement in the team, agreement in the team that you are doing this kind of ongoing refactoring, but know when to stop, know when to uh, when to say, okay, that's enough. So that's the scout rule in practice. You don't want to clean the whole forest in your area you just want to it's enough if you clean the place where you were and that's 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 cool enough so obviously it still has some code smells like we still have time entry dot save happening in the controller well that's that's the brutal life we, we can't fix everything yet however moving this into here wouldn't be such a big issue so it's just that we are limited of time here also we extracted some methods and that makes the controller may look more complicated, but it's actually more explicit that we have this kind of logic. And it's also kind of a smell with controllers, with typical race controllers, that you will see mm. that there's so many actions. And when you see the private methods, many of the private methods are actually used from one. Uh, so this should go private also soon. Uh, and so you need to understand where it's used. And very often you have methods that are used only in one action. And it's a smell of, uh, of a broken single responsibility principle sometimes, not always, that you have so many actions in one controller. So uh, I'm also, um, I think there was one blog post where I showed how to do single action controller, for example. So it's worth considering sometimes. So again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting to over engineer and split every line of code into its own file, into its own class. It's just what, what makes your, your code look uh, a bit complex, try to think what, what are the ways of refactoring. We try to be inspired by uh, some of the refactoring techniques. So I think that's, that's enough for the coding session. Uh, I can now go back to slides, but probably there are some questions and I'm happy to answer them at this moment. 
Yes, we have a lot of questions, but maybe let's go back a little bit in our list of questions. And so here it is. What is the best option? Working with service objects, form objects, and so on at the beginning of the project, or use the simplest solution, Railsway, and then refactor when you know the domain. Mm -hmm. So you're asking this question probably because you are not fully familiar with those techniques, or they um, they make they may make this impression that they that they represent some cost. But once you are very fluent with them, so I've seen programmers uh, who are experienced with those patterns being as quick with those patterns as they were in, with the raceway. So that's that's one answer. But before you are fully fluent with that, very quick with that, uh, I say that if it depends on the specifics of your project. So if you are very fluent with the raceway and you have this new project starting just today and you know that you will be in this prototyping phase for one week or two weeks, then, then stay with the raceway. So that's why I'm so focusing on the race refactoring so that you can always um, have this feeling that at some point you can change, you can refactor, you can gradually improve. So if the prototyping, so the very often changes are only two weeks in your projects, for example, then you can, uh, it's easy, it's not so easy to, to, to say that we are still in the prototyping mode, but if the requirements don't change every day or every hour, uh, then you can think that you probably you, you just left the, the prototyping phase and now you can build some more, some better structure around your code. Sometimes it's after one week, sometimes after one month. Usually it's not later than two months, I would say, from my experience. Okay, so some, some more questions maybe. Um, do you have some rule which params you pass to constructor of service object and which to execute call method? Yeah, so there are different uh, conventions here. Uh, so I, as I did it here, I just passed everything to every, all the params, uh, I mean the params here uh, to the execute method. Uh, when you are using things like adapters and repositories, they, they are becoming the parameters here. So they are the things that are not so, uh, often changed, like they're not so dynamic. They are represent the collaborators. Like those callbacks are also, I know that this split is not clear why I did something in the controller, why it's something in the execute. At the beginning, I would say it doesn't really matter. Try to get familiar with this. And later on, you will notice that it's better to pass to the constructor the things that you can, that you want to, for example, replace in tests, because it's easier to, to mock when you have a, a clear dependency in your controller and you will have those kind of uh, dependencies. While leave the details like the project ID or the project name or something like that or the current user ID or the params uh, in this execute or call method. So that's that's one, one rule you can follow. So the things that are primitives, you can use them here. Things that are, that are real objects, real collaborators, so pass them to the, con to the constructor. Sometimes the, 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 the boundary is not so clear, like here I accepted project and issue even though they are active record objects. And in, it's not a perfect setup here, but well, that's I started with some code. It's not like my fault here. I am trying to improve it. I will not do everything at once. At some point, I would prefer to, pass, to have project ID and issue ID being passed here and just to try to grab the data from the database on my own instead of the, in, instead of the controller filters. Okay, is there any other question? Okay. Okay, so maybe uh, the last one to this time slot, uh, but we'll answer all the questions afterwards, so don't worry. <laughs> so the question is, does a service object class always live in controller or is it going to be extracted to a new file? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be extracted to a new file. So for example, what I can do here is I can cut this, I can put it, for example, very often I, I also use this approach that I, I was keeping at the controller at the, at the bottom of the controller and I was working on it. So I want to keep it cl close, but for example, now I will not exchange the code between those two places so often. So I can probably move it and RubyMine has this night nice refactor move, move, and it knows that we are on a, on a class. So we can actually extract a new file it suggests the controllers because this is where we live. But if you have services, service objects, you may want to keep them in the services. And I, will, I can press refactor now, and it was moved to, to a new place. While, so this is now I'm in the new file. This is the create time entry. 
and in this place we have required relative so it's, it's all still working uh, as it should we can, we can obviously move the required relative at the top of the file that would be probably more conventional uh, so yeah so I, i'm extracting it at some point very very quickly so it's just the first minutes or maybe first one hour when i, when I keep it so close and then i extracting it and it's good to have to be confident about how you can move things around and I know in Rails it's not so easy. Rails auto loading is like a nightmare, and understanding sometimes how things should be loaded, what kind of namespace you can use, so whether you can do something like time tracking, or whether to not to have this, uh, and what kind of directory then it belongs to. I know it's difficult, but it's something you can learn and you need to learn if you want to move code around in Rails applications. So it's not so easy, and um, I'm not very happy that Redis made it this way, that we need to experiment with many different directories when it actually works well. Uh, you can move the code to, so if I look at the project view, uh, some people put uh, this kind of like domain, the logic code into the lib directory, while some say this may live in app services, while other people also do things like uh, new directory and you can say time tracking so this is like a modular approach and it's nice would it, but it, it's not so nice because uh, when you put some code in this time tracking directory then race expects uh, race auto loading works this way that you, if you want to use the time tracking mod time tracking as a module name you need to create time uh, time tracking as another directory, which looks weird, but that's the easiest way to, to work around the autoloading problem. Other ways, learn how autoloading works, works and, and use the load paths and tweak them as you want, and then you can do something nicer than this. But uh, I've seen this, this pattern enough that I know that people do it very often. All right, so let me switch to slides for a moment now, and I'm very close to finishing, and then I will answer some more questions at the end. Uh, so what we did is we look at the existing concerns, we run the test and we kept running them all the time. So I want to um, encourage you to do the same when you're refactoring, always be green, that's the rule here, and keep refactoring. So now maybe the, the this sequence diagram may look a bit more uh, familiar. We didn't introduce the form object, we just introduced a service object, we passed some params and it returns some data to us at some point. Later on we could introduce the repository, and with the repository pattern, we can we could isolate uh, from the active record a bit better. Uh, but again, with, even with the repository pattern, I I will send you some links to, to our blog posts. You can use the repository pattern and return the active record objects. That's one way. You can use the repository pattern and return the, the the domain object. That's another way. So there are benefits from both. Uh, it's more work to to return domain objects. It's more code. Uh, but overall, you have more control. And in app, one of our recent blog posts, we shown how how you can be very um, confident with changing the database schema because all you need to change is the repository, and it doesn't really leak. The abstraction doesn't leak into your other places of the of the application. So those those patterns are helping us to isolate. Uh, it's not so. Sometimes it may not be your goal, but if you want to test easily or not to be worried that Rails upgrade will break your things, then that's that may be a good approach. So the summary here is that we, uh, we were talking about the typical Rails problems. I was showing you our refactoring example here, and the patterns that we were using uh, are one way of going. So you may choose to go this way, you may choose to, to go some other way. I know that the Rails way would probably suggest you to use some, I don't know, the concerns, for example, feature. I, I'm not using it, and, and I'm not really recommending it, but it, for some people it works well. Uh, and I showed you the, how RubyMine supports you. So I, I really recommend if someone here doesn't use RubyMine, give it a try. I think it's, it's free for, for the beginning period of time. I know it's, it, it, it's priced at some level, but uh, overall it's very worth and it saved me a lot of troubles, debugging sessions and so on. So I'm really using RubyMine a lot nowadays uh, to navigate, to change the code and to, yeah, to use it. So at this URL, raceRefactoring.com slash recipes, you will find more uh, basic steps you can do. Some of them I did, I did extract a single, uh, sorry, I didn't do this. I did the service object. 
I'm showing at the, the technique that is called simple delegator, which sometimes is a bit a bit of a hack, but may help you extract a service object faster than I did it here. So I'm showing you a, a full algorithm. And this URL, the, those recipes are free, so so you can just look at them. And there are also examples of adapters repository. And I didn't show it, but it's worth it's worth being explicit with calling the render method. So you probably know that in Rails, when the action finishes, there is this implicit call to render that is not seen. But I, I'm suggesting to be very to be very explicit. So after every action, uh, put the render path to the view that you want to use, or the in the the symbol, and be very explicit that you are passing locals. So that's a way of reducing the amount of uh, reducing the amount of coupling between the instance variables. Try to reduce them. Try to move things with params and be very explicit with what you're doing. Also, I was using this, uh, I, was I was extracting the respond method. Very often you can have small extract render redirect, me redirect methods. So you want to move the details down to the like private methods and be mm, at the action level be like high level, high level mm, intentions. Routing constraints may help you when you have uh, different uh, paths of the control flow depending on the params. So sometimes, like like here in this, oops, uh, I hope it's seen. Uh, so sometimes you may want to um, have like here this time and create creation of the time entry is sometimes in, is for the project and sometimes it's for the issue and it's actually two business two different business operations. So. It's worth knowing that uh, that we can do it in the at the routing constraint level and have different actions being responsible for those different situations because those are different things. So and also it's it's worth knowing that if you have any kind of branching, so the if statements, do it at the highest level possible. So don't hide it somewhere deep down into the active record, for example. Try to move it up. So make the branching branching as soon as, as it's possible. And yeah, as Tatiana said, uh, there is this JetBrains coupon code today. Uh, you can buy the book for 20% off. It's at race.refactoring.com and it's showing all the techniques I was, uh, most of the te techniques I showed you today. And hopefully it will help you with, with refactoring those applications. And here are the simpler versions that you can, you can use for free and you can learn how to use them even just, just here. Uh, that's all from me, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer more questions now. Okay, so I think that I don't I don't think that we have a lot of time now. Okay. But um, a couple of words about uh, some links from my side as well. Of course, you can send feedback to both our Twitters, to NJ Shivda and Ruby Mine Twitters. And you're also very welcome at our support. You can see Ruby Mine support email here that you can send any questions, any feedback, whatever you want. Uh, you can always learn more about Ruby Mine at our website, of course. Uh, the recording will be available, as I said. And uh, please subscribe to our blog post uh, if you want to receive some product news. And actually, you can find an interesting interview with NJ here in our blog as well. And we have tutorials, and uh, one of them is about testing, about our spec tests that NJ mentioned a lot. So if you want to take a look a little bit deeply on what we are what's what we are supporting for our spec please welcome to this tutorial so thank you andre for webinar thank you all for joining us we are going to have more interesting webinars i hope so so please stay tuned and have a good evening or day so thank you thank you to all of you who attended thank you so goodbye everyone thank you goodbye.